optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Can I ask you a personal question? Now it is in a broken time. What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. This episode is brought to you by Audible, which has the largest selection of audiobooks on the planet. I've used Audible for many years, and I have several audiobooks to recommend right off the bat if you're looking for a new one. Ready Player One by Ernest Klein. You may have heard of it. The Tao of Seneca by Seneca, if you want to hear my favorite collection of letters of all time, as well as The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman, which is a fiction book I use to reintroduce nonfiction purists to the beauty and truth and enjoyment of fiction, the graveyard book. It is incredible. And I like the version that Neil reads himself, but the entire ensemble cast is also fun. Audible members get a credit every month good for any audiobook in the store, regardless of price, and unused credits roll over to the next month. So if you didn't like your audiobook, no problem. You can exchange it, no questions asked. Plus, your books are yours to keep. With Audible, you can go back and re-listen anytime, even if you cancel your membership. And for some books, again, Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman, I've listened many, many times. You may even just start over as soon as you finish it the first time. Audible also helps you to listen to more books by letting you switch seamlessly between devices, picking up exactly where you left off, whether it's on your phone, through your car, from a tablet, or at home on an Amazon Echo, whatever. You can get through tons of books, hands and eyes free, while doing almost anything. So that is part of the beauty of audio. It is a secondary activity when you're walking the dog, cooking, whatever it might be. Audible content includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and much more from leading audiobook publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, magazine and newspaper publishers, and business information providers. Maybe that's what I am, a business information provider. And right now, Audible is offering listeners of this podcast a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. So check it out. Go to audible.com forward slash Tim and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It is super simple. Go to audible.com forward slash Tim or text Tim to 500-500 on your telephone to get started today. Check it out. This episode is brought to you by FreshBooks. FreshBooks has become the go-to cloud accounting software for literally millions of small business owners who found a faster, more efficient, and much less stressful way to deal with their numbers. And ultimately, this helps you to focus on what you are best at. It is used by many of the fastest growing startups I've invested in or advise, and it's equally used by many of the best freelancers I work with on a daily or weekly basis. It is one of the easiest ways to send invoices, get paid, track your time, and track your clients. If you're self-employed and managing business sometimes means wrestling with spreadsheets, crumpled receipts, and other scattered pieces, FreshBooks can really help. FreshBooks allows you to do many, many different things very easily. Preparing and sending a polished branded invoice takes about 30 seconds. You can set yourself up to receive online payments from your clients in about two clicks, which on average will get you paid twice as fast. Their new proposals feature means you can include a project summary and timeline as part of your estimate. There are many, many other things. Tracking your time. The quick proposals that I mentioned, formatting free, super easy, late payment reminders so you don't have to chase people, automated expenses, sharing files and messages with your clients, award-winning customer service. They are extremely responsive, the interface is super intuitive, and there's almost no learning curve. So, in short, it's easy, it saves you time. And right now, FreshBooks is offering an unrestricted 30-day free trial for all of my listeners. To claim yours, check it out. Go to freshbooks.com forward slash Tim and enter Tim Ferris in the how did you hear about us section. And that is funky spell T-I-M-F-E-R-R-I-S-S. So again, go to freshbooks.com forward slash Tim and enter Tim Ferris in the how did you hear about us section. Check it out. Hello, boys and girls. This is Tim Ferriss, and welcome to another episode of The Tim Ferriss Show, where it is my job to interview and deconstruct world-class performers of all different types to tease out the lessons, habits, routines, and much more that you can apply in your own lives. And my guest today really blew me away. I implore you, I beg you to listen to this entire conversation. I was so impressed from start to finish. His name is George Raveling, 
And I do owe a debt of gratitude to Ryan Holiday for making this introduction. George Raveling on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at George Raveling, R A V E L I N G. Coach George Raveling.com is an 80 year old living legend and Nike's former director of international basketball. Coach Rav, as he's often called, was the first African American basketball coach in the Pac 8, Pac 12, and is often referred to as the human Google for reasons that become abundantly clear in this interview. He has held head coaching jobs at Washington State, the University of Iowa, and USC. Following a prolific basketball coaching career, he joined Nike at the request of Phil Knight, where he played an integral role in signing a reluctant, not many people know that story, Michael Jordan. He's also been inducted in the Nysmith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame, as well as the College Basketball Hall of Fame. We cover a lot in this wide-ranging conversation in Austin, Texas. We cover how he was given the original copy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, which was not the name, by the way, originally, how his practice team ended up beating the 1984 U.S. Olympic Dream Team in basketball, what, the story of getting Michael Jordan to sign with Nike, why Coach Rav has been nicknamed the Human Google, his voracious reading habit, and how he picks books and takes notes. We had a huge nerd out over how to take notes in books, the wisdom of his grandmother and other mentors, and much, much, much more. I really walked out of this conversation floating on the air and reflecting on and thinking about so much of what he shared. He's an incredibly impressive human being. I hope you enjoy this even half as much as I did, which would mean it's probably going to be one of your favorite episodes that I've done. So without further ado, please enjoy the ever-impressive George Raveling. Coach, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be part of your world. I have been looking forward to this conversation ever since our mutual friend Ryan Holiday <laughs> gave me a teaser of your life story. And when I started doing homework and prep, I started thinking to myself, I should try to get Coach to spend the next two days with me. I should cancel my flights <laughs> because we are going to barely scratch the surface in the time that we have today. And uh, I struggled with where to start because... I have pages and pages of notes of my own, and uh, you also sent me, I will give you credit where credit is due, the the absolute best exploratory bullets that any guest out of 300 plus guests has sent me. (laughs) And uh, we're going to start somewhere that I think may surprise people, and uh, that is the I Have a Dream speech. So could could you tell us about your relationship with that, please? Well, it's it's uh, uh, one of those stories about being in the right place at the right time. Um, it was a Thursday night in, in Claymont, Delaware, and I was having dinner at my best friend's uh, home. And his doctor's a very his dad was a very prominent dentist in in Wilmington. And so, in the background, as we ate dinner, in those days everyone ate dinner as a family. And so, in the background, the television was on, and the news uh, was uh, commentary was about the forthcoming march on Washington. And so, my friend was named Warren Wilson. His dad was. Dr. Woodrow Wilson. Uh, and so he asked a question of us, are you boys going to go to the March on Washington? And we said no. And he asked us why not. And we gave him some uh, youthful uh, excuse that we didn't have any money or way to get there. And so he said, well, I have a feeling this is going to be a historic event. It could be the largest gathering of black people in the history of America in one place. And so he said, and I think the two of you should be there. He said, so what I'm going to do, he had two cars. He said, I'm going to give you one of the cars and, and money and you guys sh- should attend. And so uh, the next day, we, we, we took off for Washington, D.C. on Friday. And at that time, there was one main thoroughfare into Washington, D.C. was Route 1. And so when you come in, you come in off of New York Avenue. And so there were a lot of uh, what we call motels in those days along there. And we found one that was suitable to our uh, economics. And we got a room. And so we decided that we would go down to the monument grounds just to, to get a feel for 
the best way to get there and what it was going to look like. And so as we were walking around, we encountered a gentleman, and he asked us, uh, uh, I'm 6'4", and Warren's 6'4", so he asked us if we were coming to the march the next day, and we said, absolutely. And so he said, would you want to volunteer? And so we said, for what? And he said to be security guard. So we said, sure, we'll volunteer. And he said, well, we're expecting twice the attendance that the papers are uh, predicting. And so we, we have to add uh, additional security. So he said, we'll meet you down there the next morning at 815. And so we got there early. Uh, I, we woke up. We were all excited. So we get down there and we find him. And he said, wow, you guys are really early. And so he looks at how tall we are. And he says, well, we've decided we're going to put extra security security up on the podium and so we're going to sign you guys to the podium and um and so they, they had these little white hats, which uh, maybe like a sailor hat, but they were cardboard to, to wear for identification. So we were uh, stationed at the podium where all the speakers were going to. Uh, so to give you some backdrop on it. The, all the speakers, and they start at 9 o'clock in the morning. If I remember correctly, John Lewis was the first speaker, and then there was a series of speakers throughout the day, concluding with Martin Luther King as the, the last speaker. Some people would suggest that it was he was a keynote speaker, but he really wasn't. They put King last because they knew he would hold the crowd. So part of the stipulation was each speaker had to submit in writing his speech that he was going to give. And it could, could not exceed five minutes. There was a hard and fast rule on this. And what was interesting about it was that James Baldwin submitted his speech, and, and, he, and uh, they felt it was too exclamatory. They, they were worried about getting the crowd uh, too excited and maybe having a demonstration. And, and Baldwin's speech was over five minutes, and so they wouldn't accept it, so Baldwin re- refused to speak. But he was originally to be one of the speakers. So as the day goes on, it's a hot and humid day. And and as you look out from the the Lincoln Memorial, you look out to what they call a reflecting pool all the way back to the Washington Monument. And as the longer the day went, the hotter it became, uh, the more energized people were. Uh, And so we finally get to that point uh, of the, the end of the day and Martin Luther King comes on to speak. And... So, as history will, will, will show, um, King speaks, uh, he's speaking from prepared notes, and he gets to about uh, one paragraph left, and as he's speaking, the crowd is, is, is just mesmerized by him. He, he has captured every single ounce of attention in each human being. And uh, and he had a cadence about the way he spoke that he would say, how long? Uh, and, and he had these what I call drum beats. And he had a way of, of raising and lowering his voice to, to manipulate you as a listener. And and so you, he, he's just about t- toward the end of the sp- uh, the last uh, going to the last paragraph, and you hear a voice. And today, with technology, you could certainly do it. Uh, but a female voice from seated behind the podium says, "Tell him about the dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream." Well, the voice was that of Mahalia Jackson, who most people would say is the greatest gospel, black gospel singer of all time, maybe the greatest gospel singer of all time. She had worked on previous uh, 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 demonstrations and gatherings with Martin Luther King. So she had heard Martin Luther King tell the I Have a Dream part in Selma and, and Detroit. And so... If you look at the original speech, it was not part of the original speech. And second, he's the only speaker who exceeded five minutes. And so at that point, the crowd is just mesmerized by him. And so then he ad-libs in the I Have a Dream speech. And then, he, and then at the conclusion, he goes back and, and closes out with the prepared uh, closing. So when it's over... Uh, we we were told to form a V around the podium and help the, to usher him out. So it, just as he finishes, uh, I, I, the most frequently 
ask question is, is why did you ask him for the speech? I have no idea. It was just impulse. So I say to, to Dr. King as he's following his speech, I said, Dr. King, could I have that copy of the speech? And, and just as he's folding it, he instinctively hands it to me. And, and then a rabbi who's doing the benediction says, Dr. King, that's a great speech. I, I'm so inspired. So his attention shifted away from me to the rabbi. And so uh, we, we, when the rabbi finished the benediction, I actually, CBS went through the archives of Johnson & Johnson, the Ebony Magazine, and they found the picture of me standing right beside him at the podium. So I, I actually have a picture that verifies that I was there. And CBS was able to find some footage where he was folding the speech the, the speech, and they can see him handing it, but uh, but didn't show my hand in it. And so, at, at any rate, when it's over, uh, they go over to the White House, and as they walk into the Oval Office, President Kennedy says, Dr. King, I loved your I Have a Dream speech. Well, so the media took that and ran with it, because if you see the original speech, the speech had no title. And so, little did I know at that time that this was going to take on the historic significance that it did. It actually took 50 years for it to really find its rightful place in history. It makes me mindful of something I heard uh, Malcolm X say one time, that history's best situated to record all man's deeds. So my interpretation of that is history and historians ultimately will put things in their rightful place. And so, it took 50 years. Well, so uh, I had no idea at that point when I had the speech that it, that it was going to become a, 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 a valuable historic document. So when I got back home, I put it inside of a book uh, that I had from uh, uh, that uh, President Harry Truman gave me. So my senior year at Villanova, I played in the East-West All-Star game, and it was in Kansas City. And one of the things that they did is they took us out to Independence, Missouri, to uh, meet President Truman. So, And when we went out to meet him, his office at his home was a, a replica of the, of the uh, Oval Office. And so as we walked in, each of us noticed there was two huge tables to the right with books stacked up on them. Well, at the end, after President Truman had talked with, the, with all the team and the, and the coaching staff and trainers, he, on the way out, he gave each of us a two-volume book of, 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 uh, uh, that he wrote on his presidency. And so in the book, and which I still have both of them now, both books say, uh, to George Raveling from Harry S. Truman, best wishes, and it has the date. So I put the speech inside of one of those for a couple of reasons. I would remember where it was, and two, I knew I'd never throw those books away because how many people can say they have an autographed book by the President of the United States personally to you? So it stayed there for years and years, and I never thought about it. I actually, uh, my wife didn't even know I had it. because, I, And so... I go to the University of Iowa as head basketball coach, and, of course, I'm the first black coach there and first in the Big Ten. And so there's, there's much to do about this. At that time, all the local newspapers, big newspapers, had a Sunday magazine section. Uh, on, uh, and so the cover story on the Cedar Rapids Gazette paper was going to, and this magazine section was going to be about me taking the, the uh, University of Iowa head basketball coaching job. So as he was asking questions, he, what I call a throwaway question, he said, Coach, were you ever involved in the civil rights movement? And I said, well, kind of. And he said, what does that mean? And I said, well, I went, I attended the march on Washington. I was a security guard and, uh, and I was able to secure the, the speech. And at that point, if I've ever seen a person just physically decompose, it was him. He, I mean, he was, he just, he, he didn't know, he was so much more, I couldn't figure out why he was so excited. And so he says, oh my God, are you, who happened? He said, where is it? I, I had only been there about six weeks, so I hadn't unpacked all the boxes down in the basement. So I said, oh, it's in a box down in the basement. He said, can we go look for it? And so we go down, and I figured out which box it was, and I pulled it out. And he was literally shaking. And and, and so he said, oh, my God. He said, can I call my editor? Can we take a picture of this? And so I said, sure. So little did I – that was the first public notice that I had this speech. So, so 
the story kind of now starts to split between Raveling being the head basketball coach and Raveling having this speech. And so from that point on, it, it, took, a, it took on a little uh, uh, a different significance, but it's still time had not placed it in its rightful place. And so over the years, it became more, and I, I literally, uh, one of the miracles, Tim, is that for 50 years I had this, and Nothing, no flood, no, no, a house doesn't catch on fire, somebody doesn't steal a book, whatever. And if you saw the actual speech, now I have it in a, in a vault in L.A., the, for the speech to survive this, this long and, 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 and the quality of the paper, it's typewritten, you can see little, little typos in there and so forth. And... Um, I had a friend of mine who graduated uh, with me from Villanova who was with the FBI. And, and so one time we were talking about it and he said, well, if you ever get in a situation where someone doubts that you, that you really have the speech or that it was good, he said, we can lift the fingerprints off of there. He said, your fingerprints are on there and so is King's. So it, it was an interesting circumstance that what became the focal part of the speech was something that he never really intended to use. And, and only through the motivation of Mahalia Jackson did he ad-lib the, the I Have a Dream piece in. So as the years went on, it, it, it took on a, a, a unique value. And so at one point, my uh, uh, Turner Sports does a, a documentary on it. And so... I, my wife goes to work. People are talking. Oh, I didn't know about your husband having a speech. So my uh, wife comes home one evening. She says, hey, we got to have a talk. I said, okay. <laughs> she says, the speech has got to get out of this house right away. She said, you travel too much. Somebody's going to break in the house, and, and, and I might get killed over the speech. So she said, you got to get it out of here. So we put it in the vault. And as naturally would happen, uh, various people tried to to buy it from me, but I, I never felt that I had total ownership of it. I kind of felt like I was the guardian of, of something historic, and I became so sensitive about it that uh, I stopped. I would get, On Black History Month, I'd get many invitations to come, bring the speech, talk about it, but I, I was so self-conscious that I stopped doing it because I never wanted anybody to think that I was profiting off of this, uh, and I never entertained any of the offers to, to, to sell it. And when I was growing up as a little a boy in D.C., my grandma used to always say that money's the root of all evil. Don't build your life around money. And so it wasn't, you know, I wasn't rich, but I wasn't poor and I wasn't desperate to, to make money or, or headlines on it. The headlines of, of accrued because of, of, of people's curiosity about having it. But I, I look back on it now, and it was a classic example of being in the right place at the right time, and it, which has happened so much in my life, getting good adult advice. If Dr. Wilson doesn't say, hey, you, you two need to go and I'll provide the, the, the opportunity for you, then I would have missed out on, on a piece of, uh, of history that has put an indelible mark on my life. What an incredible story. What an incredible experience! When you think about the, how the stars aligned for oh. that to happen, it, it, and uh, from that point on, uh, I, I learned a good lesson that you don't have to have a relationship with a person for them to become your your mentor. And so, in those days, I I I, I don't even know if I knew the connotation mentor, but I I I, I looked at. King more as as someone uh, as a teacher, someone I could learn from. So as we fast forward, and I'm now working at Nike, and in my office I had uh, I had this picture in my office, and it was a headshot of Martin Luther King, James Baldwin, and Malcolm X. And so when people would come into my office, they would look at the the things on the wall, and and, and they would always be drawn to that to that portrait. And so they. What was interesting, most people, uh, I would say 99% of people could, could not tell you all three of them. A lot of people would get King. 
Some would get James Baldwin, very few Malcolm X, but uh, it was rare that anyone got all three of them. So they would ask me why I had it up there. And I said, uh, they're, they're my mentors. They're my inspiration. Uh, they, they're the people that I, I, uh, whose lives I look to when I'm trying to figure out something complex. And so while I didn't have a day-to-day relationship with, with Dr. King, I had a, 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 a mental uh, day-to-day relationship, month-to-month, week-to-week, year-to-year, because there was so much that I wanted to learn from him. And one thing, while it's in my mind, I'd like to share with you, and I don't know if the vast majority of people uh, that follow King knew this. I just found out this past week in reading a book review in the New York Times book review section that when Dr. King was in the seminary at Crozier, which is in Chester, Pennsylvania, that's where he, he, he took his practice to become a preacher, uh, that doc, they had a basketball team hmm. and Dr. King was on the team. And so that, that delighted me to know and to discover that he, that he, he played basketball during the time. And the, the person who wrote the book actually found in the archives a box score from one of their games. And unfortunately, they got waxed 124 to 41. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I was so pleased to find out that there was an athletic side to him. And I don't know. Uh, it, and all I, I've read about King over the years, I'd never known that he participated in athletics. So I was, there was a, an immediate joy that, to find out that he, and particularly that he played basketball. And when you say you had a relationship with, say, Dr. King in the sense that you viewed him as a mentor or a role model, and you revisited that, would you find yourself in specific situations and ask yourself, you know, what would Dr. King do? Or how did, how did that fit in your life uh, from a mentorship standpoint? Was it just putting yourself in their shoes to make hard decisions, or how did you think? I, I think one thing that that uh, became quickly apparent to me was that the value in, in, of words and, 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 and the spoken word is such a, a powerful tool, perhaps maybe more powerful than the atom bomb in many ways. Uh, the fact that, uh, that he had a vision it, it, the, the whole I have a dream. So all great leaders, I believe, share a, a vision. And then they, 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 then, a, then they have a journey. And so he talked about the, the vision, the journey, uh, the completion of the dream and, and, and the conquering of, of injustice. But to me, King was, was so many things. He was a a preacher, he was a messenger, a visionary, he was a, a precursor, uh, a leader. He, he, he was a man for all seasons and all reasons in, in, in many ways. And so one, many times I, I, I reflect back on something that he, he said that when, I, when I'm in a tough spot and I think about giving up, uh, you, you say to yourself, this, uh, what kind of sacrifice is this going to be? And one thing I remember Dr. King saying is if a man or a woman hasn't found something in life that they're willing to die for, then perhaps they're not fit to live. And so he lived out that, that, that uh, reality that he became so deeply immersed in, in, in this mission that he ultimately had to give his, his, his life for it. And I've watched a number of documentaries over the years and, and, and on the sit-ins and doing the, the, the depth of segregation. And one was uh, the night before the, they were going to sit at the lunch counters. And, and uh, the, the person who was leading the, the demonstration as they were planning out it strategically, at the end, of, he said to them, he said, I want everybody in the room to look around at each other and shake hands. Because tomorrow night when we have this meeting, some of you are not going to be here. And I thought to myself, oh, my God, would I have the courage of commitment to know that if I were part of this demonstration, tomorrow night I might get, I have to put my life on the line. I might not be back if I'm sitting in that room. I have to say to myself, are you willing to, to, to sacrifice your life for this cause? And, and to me, a lot of the untold stories about 
uh, uh, segregation and, 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 and the injustices that black people have faced most of our lives is those people who died so that we can enjoy uh, 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 the things that we enjoy in society today. And, and uh, so to me, uh, whenever I, I, I have any questions about the depth of commitment, I, I, I go back and I say to myself, do you feel so strong about this that you'd be willing to give your life for it? Do you feel this strong about it that you would be willing to risk getting fired? And, and over the years, especially when I was at Nike, sometimes I had a depth of belief and conviction that what I was suggesting was right. And I was willing to fight right down to the end. And if it meant I got fired, then I got fired. But uh, I never allowed my, the, the position or to threaten me to be less than what I should be as a person. You mentioned your grandmother in passing. And she seems to have been a very important figure in, in your life. Uh, how did that come to be the case? Well, my grandma was was basically, uh, if I can borrow a, a religious uh, concept, my grandmother was the pope. Her word was infallible. And, and what was interesting, my grandma was a, a product of a Blackfoot Indian tribe. And uh, on both sides of our family, we really are, are descendants of, of, of uh, American Indian tribes, and which I find interesting sometimes because of the, we now I've gone through uh, these these connotations. Uh, when I was when I was uh, 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 first born, which you'll find interesting. I was born in a segregated hospital in Washington, D.C., Garfield Hospital. And there were, there were four floors for whites and one floor for blacks. So I, so I came into the world in a, in a segregated world. But um, so as, as, as I was growing up, um, when I was nine, my dad died. And when I was 13, my mom had a nervous breakdown. And she was institutionalized the rest of her life. In those days, uh, the, the, the economy was, was in poor shape. So you got rations from the government. You got like flour, sugar, so, uh, milk, so forth. And so I come home one day and my mom's standing at the sink and she's got the water running. And she's pouring this big bag of sugar into the sink and just letting the sugar go down. And so I, I grabbed it and turned it off. And I and uh, I said, Mom, what's going on? She, and she just she was incoherent. So anyway, my mom ended up being institutionalized. So now here here's George at 13 years old and uh, uh, no, I was 12. And and so, what do you do with George? He has no he has he has no parental supervision. Dad's dead. Mom's in a mental institution. But she spent most of the rest of her life there. And so, my grandma worked for this white family in Georgetown, and so she was sharing with the lady of the house this dilemma. And so, she, and she was saying, "I don't know. I, I don't know what." what I'm going to do, but I have to do something for him. And so the lady said her daughter was, was a head of Catholic charities in, in D.C., and she would uh, mention it to her. Maybe her daughter could su- do something. So lo and behold, the daughter decides that what she, she's going to help. And so she found a school, a boarding school for me, a Catholic boarding school in Pennsylvania. It was called St. Michael's School for Boys. It was, and, and so you, you, uh, she was able to get me into the school there. You, you stayed there year round as a resident. And so I went off to St. Michael's and uh, the structure where priests were, were at, uh, ran the institution and the teaching and, and the service part were done all by nuns. And so, uh, over the course of the time I was there, I did everything from bale hay to pick apples, to clean chicken coops, uh, to work in the kitchen, to scrub the floors in the chapel, to make to make beds, you, you had to do a chore to help uh, uh, offset your your presence there. And so the classes were very strict and rigorous. The, uh, it, it, the classes were small, so we got a lot of individual attention. And um, it was it, it was just a, a stroke of of of. of uh, 
a miracle that my grandma was able to get me into this situation. And she, my grandma never graduated from high school. In fact, no one in my family, uh, my mom or dad, finished high school. But she knew that there had to be a better way for me. And she did everything that she could to, to, to help me grow as a person. I remember one, one, one time, Tim, my grandma took myself and my brother out, and, uh, and she said, uh, we're going to go outside. I want to teach you some, some manners and lessons. And so my, my, my grandma takes my brother and I out on the street, and she says, and I'm going to start to teach you how to treat women. Women are to be respected. And so... She, she says, when you walk down the street, you always walk on the outside. A woman always walks on the inside. When you, when you, when you uh, get to the corner, you make sure you check the traffic in both ways before, and then you walk as, more as a, a guard. Uh, if, if a woman's getting in the car, you always open the door for them first. If you sit down at the table for the meal, the, 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 you, you hold the chair and help them. And so long before feminist uh, uh, or a movement be- was was even thought of, my grandmother was teaching us social graces. Um, yes, sir. No, sir. I, I, I go on a flight now and, and I, it's just part of my DNA. Uh, when people say something, if a stewardess says something, I say, yes, ma'am, no, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. And I'm, I'm 80 years old, and I still do that. But so invariably, what will happen on the flight is either during the flight or at the end, the, the stewardess will say to me, hey, can I ask you a question? And I'll say, yes, and I know it's coming. And they'll say, are you, uh, are you uh, from the military? And I say, well, I was in the military, but, but no, I'm not in the military now. And and they say, well, are you from the South? And I said, no. And so I said, why do you ask? And they say, well, because you're so polite. No one says yes, ma'am, and no. And I have a lot of people now who, who find it uncomfortable if I say yes, sir, at 80 years old, and they're younger than me. But it's just the, the, the way I, I, I was born. My grandma was, was huge on manners. And if we went somewhere... And and there were adults there in those days. If you were a child, kids were to be seen and not heard. And so if if there was a conversation going on again with adults, you just listen. And but if if someone asked me a question and I didn't say yes, ma'am and no, ma'am, when I got home, my grandma would say, "I heard Miss Jenkins asked you that, and you, you just said yeah." And she said, "Bend over," and she would she whip me. <laughs> and so and. My greatest quote for my grandma was, she told me one time, she said, there's more horses' asses in the world than there are horses. <laughs> now, that's all, that's been my favorite grandma quote. <laughs> She's a good teacher and a good enforcer, yes. it sounds like. <laughs> well, are, were there any other mentors during that or teachers or people who had a, a strong impact on you over that stay in that Catholic school, yeah, well, sister, there was a nun who took a liking to me named Sister Dolores. She she lived to be eighty seven, but she, she, for some reason, she saw something in me that I never saw in myself, and and she would always uh, say positive things to me. At the time, I, I didn't realize the, the value of them, but she'd always say to me. George, you can be special, or uh, or if I wasn't working up to my potential in whatever area it was, she would say, "Now that's not being special, and you were you, you're on earth to be special." And I, to me, I would never had anybody look at me and, and 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 make me think I could be anything other than than average. But she she constantly preached that to me. And she would watch the basketball games, and, and, and after she would come up, or the next day in class, she would say, well, you know, in the third quarter, you, 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 really, you really were loafing out there. I was embarrassed. <laughs> and, but she always found a way to, to uh, uh, I'd write a paper, and she'd read it, and she'd say, this is really good. But this is not your best stuff. You can do better. And so she always kind of created this contest of uh, having me compete it, compete against myself. It was never competing against the other students. It was always me competing against myself. So she she 
taught me the 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 power of 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 positive of a positive attitude and she would never allow me to think negatively and then the other person was my college uh, was my high school coach uh he taught me so many lessons about life at our school there, there were four sports boxing baseball basketball and football and so one of the things that you learned if you wanted to get off campus some you you you, you participate in sports and so i actually participated in every one and the one that probably gets zero attention because a lot of people just don't know was boxing i actually boxed golden glove for really? two years yeah i i i know you your chinese foot boxing so you yeah. can probably identify with that but <laughs> i wouldn't want to deal with your reach no. <laughs> And so I, I actually, somewhere in one of my high school scrapbooks, I have a picture of me in the ring. In those days, you wore the headgear and you right. had the big, gla- big gloves. And so I fought in, in my weight class, which at that time, I wish I was uh, uh, under 200 pounds now. But uh, so I, I actually won my, my senior year. I won a Golden Glove event. And so, uh, and then I played uh, baseball. I played first base and pitched. And in football, I played in all except the last year. And then uh, we didn't have a good quarterback, so my coach put me at quarterback. But I was, um, I, believe me, uh, I, they, they, uh, my talents were, I wouldn't even have gotten a walk on offer, but I was the quarterback. And then what happened was basketball between my eighth grade year and ninth grade year I grew four inches so I went from six foot to six four in one year and so obviously the height advantage proved beneficial to me early on in basketball and so over the course of the four years I got better and better and when I look back on it now, a lot of it was Sister Dolores encouraging me, kept telling me, oh, you're getting better. Oh. And and, uh, you, and so she kept me motivated all the time. So my senior year, uh, I ended up being the second leading scorer in the state of Pennsylvania. And um, so at this point, uh, let's just step back real quick. So at the end of my junior year, I'm, wait, I'm going, waiting for to take the Greyhound bus back to D.C. for uh, I got a week vacation back in D.C. So I'm sitting there waiting for the bus to come by. And, Tim, I can remember it was like yesterday. I thought to myself, God, if I can just graduate and become a pilot in the Air Force, I'll have it made. I had no idea anything about basketball was going to take me and get me a scholarship. So the following year, I end up the second leading scorer in the state. And so we're playing at St. Rose in Carbondale. And after the game, when I come out of the locker room, a gentleman comes up to me and he says, hi, my name's Jack Ramsey. I'm the coach at at St. Joe College. And he hands me a, a, a card. Of course, Jack Ramsey is in the Basketball Hall of Fame. Great coach. And so he said that I like the way you play. We'd like to offer you a scholarship. And I said, yes, sir. And Every time he'd say something, I'd just say, yes, sir, because I didn't know what else to say. And so on the school bus ride back to the uh, school, my uh, coach says, who was that man you were talking to outside the locker room? And I said he was a coach, and I handed him to the card. And so my coach says, well, what did he tell you? And I said he said that uh, he he wanted to offer me a scholarship. And so I said, Coach, what's a scholarship? Because I had no idea what that you could uh, that they would pay for your education in return. You participated in, in basketball. So then, by over the course of the remainder of the season, I had an offer from uh, Michigan State, Villanova, and uh, and Gettysburg, and a, f- a bunch of other schools. But I had Gettysburg because their coach did the best job of recruiting me. He'd write me hand written le- letters four and five pages on what it was going to mean to go to Gettysburg and so forth. He'd drive up to games. He was so persistent. But at the end of the day, the reality was this. As far as the nuns and the priests were concerned, it would, it would, have, it would have been heresy to go to, to a, a state institution. I was going to a Catholic school. So then it basically came down to St. Joe's in Villanova, and I went down for the visit in, at Villanova. And while I was there, they gave me admissions exam. You didn't have PSAT and ACT then. And so I took the admissions exam the first day I was there. And 
once again, amazing insight by Sister Dolores. She, when she found out I was going to get scholarship offers, she started to make me stay after school every day and work on, on the entrance exams. So, uh, so I was prepared. And, and, I, and so the Sunday before we left to drive back up to Hoban Heights, uh, the, the coach Al Severance offered me a scholarship, and and they wanted a decision why we were there. So basically, my my high school coach made the decision. He thought that that's where I should go, and and uh, little did I know that that basketball was going to be this transformative uh, force in my life that was going to take me someplace I never thought that I could go. Tim, never in my life, and I don't mean this in a mean spirited way, did. Anyone in my family ever say to me, George, when you grow up, you, I want you to go to college. It was, there was no reason for them to think that. Uh, it, at that time, it, was, it, it, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't even a dream or, or thought because nobody had, had received that type of education. And go back to my grandma. So I call my grandma and I tell her what's going on and then I'm going to get this scholarship. And so I, I tell her, uh, well, how does it work? I said, okay, so if, if I agree to play on the basketball team for the four years, they'll, they'll pay for my education. So my, so all of a sudden there's utter silence on the phone. And I said, grandma, are you still there? And she said, yes. And I said, why are you so quiet? She says, oh, I just feel like a failure. I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, I thought I raised you better than that. And I said, well, Grandma, what did I do wrong? And she said, stupid. No white people are going to give you a, a, a free education to play basketball. You, how, can you go, how could you be so stupid to believe? She could not comprehend that that because of the, the racial situation that someone would pay for your education and all you had to do was play basketball. And she, she just, it, it took her over a year to, before she fully was able to even trust that this was, when I finally got on campus at Villanova and, and went to the first class, then, then she, she kind of started to, to, to be a lot more trustful uh, of the process. But, uh, it, 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 it was a. I look back on it now, and it just shows you the depth and of a stain of of racism and and how things are uh, uh, are implanted in your mind that you ju- you just can't. They're co- incomprehensible. So on that on that note, when I was doing homework, I read somewhere that you have a collection of racist mementos. Yes, in your house. Wow, you did do some research. Could you? <laughs> I, I, beyond that, I don't know the details, but that just stuck in my mind. And because uh, that's something I think that a lot of people would actively avoid. So why do you have this collection? Well, first of all, I, uh, you know, uh, no one's ever asked me that question, but I spent, I probably have over $100,000 worth of black collectibles for about eight or nine years. That it, it became an obsession with me. And so I would go to antique shows and, 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 and go to stores and hunt down all black memorabilia. I have things that date back before. I, I actually have a, a first edition of Uncle Tom's Cabin. So I started to collect books, figurines, uh, and postcards. Postcards, I, was, I started out with figurines. And so I, um, I, I, a friend of mine told me about... Uh, an antique store that was closing, and and the gentleman had a huge collection of black collectibles, and so it was in San Pedro. So I went down and I, and I I paid him thirty five thousand dollars for the collectibles. He had over a hundred pieces, and part of the deal was that he had to mark them and write a little card so I would understand the historic significance of them. Postcards. Tim, I have them back before you had, which this might surprise you. Originally, you didn't have to put a stamp on on a postcard to send it out to mail. So I have I have them back in the the, the earliest one I have is is 1891. Wow! But what was interesting about the black postcards was they always made blacks. Uh, 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 
uh, they picture them in a derogatory term. One of the more frequent ones you see is a black person with with uh, e- e- eating watermelon with a, with a smile on his face. Uh, but they were all derogatory. Now, here's what's further interesting. On we've now. Uh, you put stamps on them, so I was able to read the messages on some of them, and and uh, and so the one that I remember the most is a lady's writing to one of her girlfriends, and we'll just make up the name. She says, "Helen, we have a nigga that works at our house that smiles just like him," and so in those days, to use the word "nigger" was commonplace, uh, and. You, you just learn. Uh, I don't know that you ever learned to accept it, but it was it was something that was said commonplace. So I started to build this historic collection of of, of memorabilia, so that I could have a legacy for my children and their children, and I could uh, I have them on display at my home to remind me of how, uh, of of where we were and where we are today. And and the trials and tribulations that we've gone through. So, I, I, I easily have postcards. I, I probably have over three hundred of the postcards, and I probably have about five hundred of the uh, uh, figurines. I was just thinking because I have some. I have some the original Anja Mama uh, uh, flower part uh, 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 packs, and that I. It, it, once I got going, it was amazing the things that I was able to to collect. And uh, so I had so many of them that I couldn't put them all on display. So I have probably three quarters of them are boxed up in storage. But and then the, the others are, are, are around my house. Do you collect anything else or have you collected anything else? Uh, books and friends. <laughs> uh, I. I uh, in my library at home, I have well over 2,500 books, and probably I have another uh, uh, six or 700 that are, that are in storage because it just ran out of uh, space. But I, I, I just continue to uh, buy books to read them. I have, uh, as you probably researched, I have an unusual way of going about reading books, but... Uh, and, 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 and friends, I, I don't have a strategy or anything for uh, friends that most times people, when I meet them, are not who they ended up being, whether it was Phil Knight, Bob Knight, John Thompson, Sonny Booker. I could tell you tons of people when I met them, they were not who they ended up being. But for some reason, we were able to build an authentic and sustainable uh, re- relationship. And I've always looked upon relationships as a privilege uh, that you have and and you at the end of the day at the core of all relationships in my mind is trust and respect and so both of those have to be earned and so over the years uh, I've met people and unintentionally we've stayed in touch and there's been this level of trust that uh, that's uh, allowed the the, the relationship to endure, but it's something, it's a lot like marriage. You have to work at it. You have to, 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 to understand that there's a balance in relationships that, and, and with me, I, I, I'm, I, I the, the number one thing that I ask myself continually is what can I do for, for you? And, uh, your your good friend Ryan Holiday and I had dinner last night, and one of the very last things I said to him, I said, Ryan, is there anything I can be doing for you in the next 30 days? I've always had this theory that if you help enough people get what they want, you'll always get what you want. And so I've never tried to enter a relationship based on selfish motives that if I know this person I'm going to get these benefits I I, I I so I try to find out what do we have in common as people what is it that we can share how can I help this person no matter how famous they are how successful they are everyone has certain needs even if they're just psychological needs or or we all need truth tellers in our life and so um 
in building relationships, I try to make sure that I surround myself with people who who want to see me become better and can help me become better, that I can learn from them and, and that I can contribute to their lives. And so um, most of the, the, the friendships I have in life, they they all started by by mistake. Uh, you're one of the young men that that's here today uh, that has taught me almost all I know about technology. I spoke at a clinic in in, in Orlando, and I so uh, a friend of mine, Kevin Eastman, was running the clinic, and uh, I said to him, I said, "Who's gonna Who's gonna put my presentation up on the screen in that? Do you have a uh, IT guy?" And he said, "Yes." And so so I said, "Well, introduce him to me because I want to put my presentation up. I want to walk to the back of the room and, and make sure it's clear and so forth." So. So uh, I met Alex Lavoisier, and and uh, during the time I was there, uh, we just hit it off. And so when he, I, I'm pretty sure he was taking me back to the airport, and I asked him if he, if he would be interested in doing a website for me, and he said yes. And so that's how it started, and it's turned into a lifelong friendship. And um, and I think that was the start of me recognizing that. I needed to be around more young people. And so I, I, I don't associate, and maybe it's bad to say this, but I don't hang out with many people my own age. Most of the people that I associate with are, are younger people because I think they're the future. They're smart. They're, they're naive enough that they'll tell you the truth. And, <laughs> and, uh, and they're not afraid to tell you if they think you're wrong. And when I hang around people my own age, it tends to always revert back to the past. And, and so, and, and I don't want to talk about coaching at Washington State or being the first black this or the first black that. What I want to do is, is, is figure out at 80 years old, what is it that I don't know but need to know? And how is this going to help me stay relevant in this ever-changing world? And so I have tend to, to spend most of my time with younger people who inspire me, who who I can uh, and have a, a partnership with. That's the other thing about relationships. I think relationships at their most authentic stage, it, it's a partnership. It's it it's uh, we we share we share common vision, common goals, common objectives, common strategy, common execution plan. It, it's it's a, a we mentality. It's not a me mentality, and it's a win win mentality. It's not. I win, you lose, or you lose, I win. Uh, it's not about that. We, we we were in this thing together, and we're in the boat together. We're going to row in the same direction, and, and we're going to take get the boat ashore. You mentioned books, and uh, I want to make sure we give reading at least a, f- a few minutes, because you are known as a voracious reader, the human Google, one nickname, and you've read probably, I'm sure, thousands of books at this point. Uh, you were very kind when we first got here, where we're recording this right now. You said, I learned from the uh, the wise men. It's always a good thing to bear gifts or something along those lines. And you gave me several books. So you've also gifted many, many different books. Uh, how did this love affair with books start? And could you tell us about how you read books? Because as you alluded to earlier, you have a particular way of reading books. Well, as I look back on it now, Tim, uh, and, and with a point of reference to so many times as we speak, it's always going to be my grandma. Well, my grandma told me one time, and, and uh, she used to, when she'd be in the kitchen cooking, she'd tell me stories. And one time my grandma told me, she said, George, you know, back in the days of slavery, the plantation owners used to, to put their money in books and, and, and hide them up on the, sh- put them up on the bookshelves. As, because the banking system wasn't as sophisticated as it is today. And so I said, well, Grandma, why, why did they do that? And she said, because they, they didn't have to worry about the slaves stealing the money because the slaves would never take the books off the shelf because they couldn't read. And so from that, I began to understand that as long as someone can control your mind, they can control who you are in your body. And so I, I decided that I was never going to allow myself to be in a position where 
uh, someone can c- c- could control my mind and control my body because of my lack of information and knowledge. And, and so I, I decided that I was going to try to read and learn as much as I possibly could on a continual basis because I, I, I believe that uh, people will, will have a greater respect for you if if they respect you in, intellectually, and I've often felt in life if 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 I had the choice between Tim liking me or or Tim respecting me, I'd far more hope that that you respect me than like me. And I figure the byproduct of you respecting me will be that you'll you'll learn to like me. So I don't work at trying to get people to, to like me. So I've I've been on this mission for for a reading for years and years and years. And it's it's become an obsession now with me. I I I, I don't go anywhere without a book and, and, and a notebook. Uh, so I, if, I'm, if I'm in line, if I go to the doctor's office, I take a book with me. If I'm in the, I, I have a new system now. If I go to a bookstore, if I'm in Barnes & Noble, and the line has got eight or nine people in it, rather than stand there uh, for 10 minutes waiting, I start, I'll start reading the book right there in line and start underlining things. And uh, so I have... A, all these quirks that I've uh, acquired over the years with reading books. First of all, um, um, I divide the book into messages. I don't think I don't spend any time now trying to read a whole book because there, there, there's probably in most books there's probably maybe eight to ten chapters that are really powerful and influential, uh, and and the others I skim through. So I never start a book from the front. And, 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 go, and go to the back. I just go, I'll open the index and I'll find what I believe is an interesting chapter and I start there. And that's actually how I purchase a book. When I'm in the bookstore, I have this a routine that I go through that, and, and, and if it if passes, I buy the book. And if it doesn't, I don't buy the book. And uh, what's your routine? So, so if I, let's say, I'm, I'm going to envision this one. So uh, uh, our office is in El Segundo, which is uh, outside of Los Angeles. And, and so I go to Barnes & Noble there. One thing I found out that because there's so many corporate offices within a, a, a two-mile radius that they tend to house uh, really excellent uh, business books. So I'll go in, and as soon as I go in, I go. I look at the books that are on reduction sale to see if there's some something there that might be a, a, a good buy. Then I go to the new, re, new releases, nonfiction, and... Uh, by the way, I go to I go to a bookstore f- four to five days out of the week. I, I'm constantly going in, and I just call it search and discovery. So I'll go to the new releases in a nonfiction, and I'll look through the books. And there's usually 20 books on the table. I'd say eight out of ten times I'm going to find a book that that I, I had never heard of before. And so I'll pick the book up. I I I I, I go to the back. I read about the author, then I go to the front part and I read the, the promos down the side. And then the next thing I do is I go to the uh, the chapters and, and I, I'll find a chapter and I'll open it up and I'll see uh, it, 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 the writer's style. I, I look at the style. Is this someone that's, that's a book filled with a lot of statistics or stories? Because I know what I'm looking for. The books that I've have had the most impact are the ones that make me change the way I think or act or behave. Uh, or, and uh, those are the books that ultimately end up being the best for me. So I'll go through the book. And then once I find this one chapter, I start to read some of it. And, I'll, and I can tell if this is going to be me or not. And at that point, I'll, I'll, I'll purchase the book. But I just don't go in and, and, and buy a book based on on the top ten. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just that I've had better success. And then, uh, so now, here at 80 years old, two of my favorite authors are Ryan Holiday and Walter Isaacson. Uh, They've both taken me on interesting intellectual journeys. The first book I read by Walter Isaacson was Steve Jobs. And 
Oh, I, I was so blown away. I, I, I had I underlined about three quarters of the book. I was quoting, writing down quotes. And, and uh, as you know, the Steve Jobs book couldn't be anything you want it to be. It can be a, a thesis on leadership. Uh, it was just utterly fascinating. I loved uh, Walter Isaacson's writing style. So when I finished the book, I looked, I went back, I said, damn, I like the way the, 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 he, uh, he writes. So I go back and I look to see what else he had written. And so I, then I see he's done a book on Benjamin Franklin. He's done a, a book on, uh, on Einstein. So at the, and uh, subsequently Kissinger and others. Uh, so I I go to the bookstore and I buy the Benjamin Franklin book and I am blown away and a little sad because I feel like, God damn, I went through all this education. No one ever taught me any of this stuff other than the, the kite. Uh, and so before that, I think if you'd have asked me who was the most important American of all time, I think I would have probably tended to say Abraham Lincoln. But after I read Isaacson's book on Benjamin Franklin, it was, it was, uh, I, I would now feel, I mean, the, you know, the lottery system, the, uh, the banking, schools, streets, uh, the guy, he did so many uh, unbelievable things. And then from there I went to, to uh, Einstein. And anybody who can write a book on Einstein that an idiot like me can understand <laughs> the the the, the uh, uh, physics and and it was it was absolutely uh, it was a miracle. So in the book, Tim, I read uh, that Einstein was very active in what they would capture in those times as the Negro movement. And it says that he wrote a, a, a book on Einstein and the Negro movement. Well, I had never heard of this. So I immediately stopped reading and go Google Einstein on the Negro problem. And uh, lo and behold, it comes up. So I, I, I chased the book down. And uh, so what I find that a lot of times in reading books and is uh, in, 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 in your book, Tools of the Titan, I'm reading and I and I see this. You mentioned in there about masterminds, and I had never heard of masterminds. So I I, I uh, circle it and I write Google behind it. So I go back and I go online and I and I, uh, and I, and I find out. Wow! So I'm thinking to myself, Oh my God! How did I never knew about this? So how do I how do I become part of it? So I send some information to Ryan Holiday about about this mastermind. So he gets back to me. He says, oh, I, I'm surprised you didn't know about that. He says, uh, you, you want to go? I'll get you in. So the next thing I know, I get this invite to go to, to masterminds in, in Carmel Valley. And, and my 80 years on earth, that was the greatest collection of intellects that I'd ever been around in my in my life. I was so intimidated. And what was marvelous, that was when I knew I was on the right path. Because every I'm 80 years old. The next oldest person there is probably 49. They're all young, energetic people. And I, I was, I, I was I readily admit, I was so intimidated. I didn't think, I was thinking to myself, God, how am I going to fit in? And every night I went to bed with the worst headaches that I ever had because I was <laughs> I couldn't process all this stuff. I felt I, I, by the second day I've already filled up a notebook of notes, and uh, it was one of those life changing experiences. So you you helped me uh, grow as a person just by what you mentioned in in in, in, in Tools of the Titan. Well, thank you for reading it first of all, and uh, this is I'm. I'm, I'm sure that uh, with with all my notes here today, <laughs> I'm going to have to figure out a way to have another conversation with you for sure. So I hope, hopefully, I won't blow it between now and the end of the interview. But uh, books that you've reread the most yourself or gifted to other people the most. Are there any uh, books that come to mind? Well, I. I, I... You know, being 80 years old, it's a long span of of of, of uh, reading. Uh, the books that I've given out the most, uh, rarely do I I, meet, I go to meet anyone, and I don't. I, I can't tell you the last time I met someone and I didn't bring them a book. It's just become a habit now to bring to give them a book. In most cases, I give them two or three books, but the books that I've given away the most lately 
are uh, Ryan's two books, Obstacles and, and Ego is the Enemy, and uh, 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson, who uh, uh, I actually, that, this was one where I, I happen to go into Barnes and Noble the day the book arrives, and I go through it, and it gets passes my test. And so I get back to the, to the hotel, and I start reading the book, and before I know it, it's 2 a.m. in the morning, and I'm, and I'm still, I'm, the guy's got me hooked already. And so I start telling people, uh, oh, you got to get this book. I, and no one's ever heard of this guy, although in Canada I understand he's quite controversial. He te- he's a professor at the University of Toronto. So then about three weeks go by, and all of a sudden there's an explosion. It's now number two on the bestsellers and so forth. So I would say I probably have given away somewhere between 20 and and 30 copies of that to friends. uh, I'll get a note from someone every now and then saying, hey, tell me a good book to read. That that's the one I I recommend the most. Uh, I I give Tim's, uh, I mean, Ryan's books away a lot. One thing that I like about Ryan's book is it's it's easier to to, to carry because it's smaller. Yeah. So I can I can get a little uh, uh, bag and I can put twelve of them in there. Yeah, mine are so, mine are not as <laughs> user friendly from carrying perspective. No, but but th- th- that's the ch- that's the ch- one thing I found with your two books is it's uh, I take them on as a personal challenge. I said <laughs> if he if he spent this much time. With this many pages, I am not going to allow the, the the length of the book to intimidate me. I'm going to see this yeah. as as an opportunity. And so, uh, you, you, uh, what what I did with Tools of the Titan was that I, I call that my China book. So uh, it's it's 13 hours to Shanghai or 13 hours to Hong Kong and 13 coming back. That's 26 hours, man. So I can, I can, I can knock, knock that sucker out. I just, and, <laughs> and some books you just have to find the right environment in, yeah. in which to read them. Totally. So I'm going to actually just pause for a minute. We'll keep the recording going. I'm going to go grab the books that you brought for me. Cause okay. I'd love to talk about those. I'll be okay. right back. Okay. So here we have five books. And I'll just read off the titles quickly, and then uh, I'd love to hear you explain your reasons for choosing a few of these, perhaps. So the first is Life is So Good, George Dawson and Richard Glaubman. The next is The True Believer, subtitle Thoughts on the Nature of Mass Movements by Eric Hoffer. Next, we have Blue Highways by William Least Heat Moon. That's quite a name. Then we have Whiplash, How to Survive Our Faster Future, Joy Ito and Jeff Howe. Actually, no, Joy. I have not read this book, though. Uh, Truth, Hector MacDonald. Uh, I would love to hear you uh, explain why you like or why you chose perhaps a few of these. I, I think, well, my first goal was, uh, as I said to you when I first entered the room, is that uh, the, what I learned from the three wise men was they always came bearing gifts. And so I felt that uh, that I wanted to share something with you as you were of values, as you were sharing something with me of value and allow me to be on your program. So I thought long and hard about the types of books that uh, a Princeton graduate <laughs> would find interesting. And so I went back through, and, I, and I, I, uh, the, the, the first one is Life is So Good, is about, about a, a black young man who, who, who was a slave. And at 98 years old, he decides that he's going to teach himself to write. Wow. And, and then he subsequently goes back and gets his GED. And uh, it's a fascinating story about that he never allowed his environment to 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 uh, imprison him. He it, it it took him a while to realize that that he had the capabilities to still read. But what was more important was that he wanted to do it, and so he he taught himself to read. He ended up going back to school, and I, and one of the things in here was uh, uh, they have a couple of letters that young kids who read the book and and so here's a cute one it says dear mr dawson i'm in second grade i live in wisconsin i'm glad that your brain still works 
happy uh, 10th anniversary. And then uh, the, the one other one it says, I'm happy that you can read now. I'm glad you like school. I do too. I'm in the fourth grade. Your friend, Alex. <laughs> so cute. it just, and uh, this is uh, to me is one of the true classics of all time. This is uh, The True Believer by Eric Hoffer. Eric Hoffer was a longshoreman in San Francisco. He's self-educated. And, and this book is about, uh, about uh, fanatics and how the people become so uh, engrossed in mass movements. A, a lot of the backdrop for his rationale has to do with Hitler's rise to power in Germany. And and uh, this this uh, I just want to remember I'm 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 pretty sure the book came out in in 1951 he wrote this and so it's every bit as uh, uh, contemporary as in fact if there was one of these books that I would say that you sh- someone should pick up and read right now I would say it's so applicable even though it was written in 51 uh, on uh, uh, on is this The True Believer by Eric Hoffer. I don't think you can get it in, in hardback now, but it's a marvelous book. Blue Highways is a, uh, was one that I read twice, and, and uh, William Lee's Heat Moon was a professor at, uh, in, in English at the University of Missouri, and he arrived at a point where he was totally bored at being a professor, and he makes a, 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 a unique decision to abandon his career, sell everything he has. He, he has a, a credit card. He sells everything he has, and he decides that he's going he's gonna to travel the blue highways of life, and he's going to go all around the, the, the America, and all he's going to do is, is go into small towns off of blue highways and, and, and t- take up residence there for a day, two, a week, and just talk to the local inhabitants and go into restaurants and, and learn other people's stories and, 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 and their challenges and successes. And so... The, the blue highway connotation, uh, and I noticed because I taught map reading when I was in the army, is the, 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 on a map, the, the, the blue highways are, are, are secondary thoroughfare. And, and uh, as the, the major highways that they're drawn in red. And so he decided that I don't want to travel around America on the main highways of life because the real stories are off the blue highways. And, and it, it's just a, an incredible story uh, of, of his journey. And it gives you a look at, at, at uh, America uh, from a, a perspective that you, you would normally. Uh, and what you find out, even in these little towns around America, there, 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 there's not a whole lot of difference. People, they, 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 they have their anxiety, they have their joys, they have their visions. But one thing I noticed was that people in the smaller towns tend to lead a much simpler life. And, 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 uh, and their values are, 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 are a lot more sustainable. And what I mean by that, they're, they're, they, they have fixed values that they've grown up with from a child, and they've never compromised. And this is a great book. I, I uh, once again, I spent a, a good bit of time trying to figure out which ones I thought you would would like. The the, the actual next one is I, I bought at the University of Penn bookstore uh, uh, about five months ago. I never go to Philadelphia and don't go to the Penn bookstore, and and they have an incredible. Uh, uh, collection of books, and so at that time I was thinking to myself, you know, you need to change the the subjects matter a little bit. Uh, the uh, dominant conversation is America is, is the future, the future. Get to the future first. What's the future going to be look like? And so I started to realize, you know, you need to understand more about what it the future and what it is and what the potential are. So I'm as I'm going through going to the bookstore, I decide only books I'm going to buy are books that talk about the future. So I ended up buying about six books. And so I came across this as, as the good Lord helped me discover this book, and it's called Whiplash, How to Survive Our, uh, our, our, uh, our Faster Future. And it's written by two uh, professors at MIT. And the book is 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 incredible, and as you can see, wow. I, 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 I destroy you a, books. You have a lot of underlines. Do you yeah. mind if I take a quick look oh, no, at no, it? No, 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 no. I just want to. I'm a bit of a note taking fanatic, so I'll always 
fascinated to see how people take notes. So you have underlines, you have things that are circled, and I see Google here. Then you have something that is circled and looks like it has spines around it. It's like almost like a cactus. So is that, uh, yeah, what do you reserve that for? So, 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 so the ones with circle are, I'm always looking for way, new ways to explain things and to teach. So those are words that I'll go back and I'll transfer into one of my journals because I'm looking for new ways to explain things. Sometimes a, a person will be mentioned, and, I, and so I'll circle that. I'll, I'll write those down. So every day I, I take about a half an hour on in Google. I Google people's names. I Google, as I, as I said, with masterminds. And then I, 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 uh, I'll have where you see the markings on the side of a paragraph. That right. means when I go back that I want to reread that in its entirety, and it's really important. Oh, these, this marking yes. right here. Yes. So, so, so what so, it looks like, just so for people who are listening to this, it's, it's basically a bunch of horizontal lines stacked uh, in the margin from the beginning of, say, this paragraph to the bottom of the paragraph. So that's something that you will reread. Yes. And I make comments like on this paragraph I wrote, un- un- unbelievable. Uh, this was a quote that I wanted to, to put in my journal on quotes. And, and so th- this was a person that was mentioned that I want to I, w- I want to Google. A lot of times what will happen, Tim, I go back and I Google a person and and uh, and I'll and then immediately I go to see if they have a Twitter account. And yes. if they do, then I then I sign up for their Twitter account. And so to me, the handheld device has become my own personal library and, and my source of information. But where where uh, I've discovered a growing problem is is there's this huge proliferation of information today. We're overwhelmed with information. Uh, And so what I find out is that for me... I have to ha- I have to segment the information. So I, I have this little formula: information equals knowledge, knowledge equals wisdom, wisdom in- equals growth. growth. Growth allows me to share. So, so I take the the the, the information and I segment it into magazine reading, blogs, articles, and books. And what I found out. Uh, is that I was devoting uh, an inordinate amount of time to blogs, articles, and magazines and newspapers, and 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 it was it was compromising my book reading. So what I had to do was to start uh, to plan out my week, and so I'll have I'll have a day where I say uh, 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 blogs magazines and, and, and newspapers and then I'll have a day where it's book day so I'm that day I'm I, I'm I, I'm not doing anything but reading reading my books the other way, thing I have to do is try to figure out other ways to get book reading in so if I if I uh, hop on a flight from LA to uh, to Austin I, 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 I put four books in, in in my book bag that I carry on the plane and I I read four books at a time. I have a, a lot of crazy things I do. For is this exa- what you're reading now? I, I, this is one of them. Yes. Um, so so just for people wondering, this is <laughs> I love how wide ranging this is. The Mind is the title. It's Projections and Multiple Facets by Yogi Bhajan, PhD, Master of Kundalini Yoga, with Guru Charan S. Khalsa, PhD. Amazing. So, so what I do is, if I get bored uh, when I'm reading, uh, I'll just switch to another book, or uh, and and, and uh, until I get one that really captures my attention. So, when I get on the plane, I'm gonna. I usually start off. I read the Wall Street and New York Times and the local paper, and then by the second half, I'll go to my books and. So, I, I, like I said, I just have all these crazy things. So, for example, uh, I've, I've trained myself to understand that the, the blank pages, I've made all the blank pages in a book 
uh, uh, valuable because I, I take every blank page and I write and I write uh, notes in there, so I don't have to to switch to my notebook. Real, it's more handy. So as you can see, on a lot of the blank pages, and you're writing I, on every I, I, every I, blank I, page. Yeah, I write and 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 as I I, I go around, I skip around. Oh, and wow! Look. So hold on. So in this spread, you have three different highlighters. You have, I suppose, pink, yellow, and green, and you have some red emphasis at the top of of that particular page well what 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 i what i do is uh, it, it helps redirect my attention uh to what's important if if i'm uh, if you saw a speech that I gave, for example, I was a graduation speaker a couple of years ago at Villanova, and if you saw the the, the speech, it, 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 it's 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 just a maze of colors, and I my brain is trained that the the colors will 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 redirect my attention, and so if it's all pink, then then. then in, in many ways, it really wasn't any sense to underline it. I mean, to, to color it. So I, I tend to go back. Once I read this a book, I go back now and I'll I'll I'll, I'll reread the book and and, and 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 go with the underlining again. And sometimes, if it's really powerful enough, I just do it right then. So on the uh, the key phrases or words that you circle. So my system is I put PH in the margin next to it, which stands for phrase. And then on the very beginning of the book, I create an index of phrases. So I'll have PH and then I'll put in the the book numbers. And uh, similarly, you do these multiple passes. So when I'll go through a book and I'll underline or highlight, and then I'll go through it a second time in the margin, I'll put T2 and a circle around it just for Tim too, like second pass Mm -hmm. for things I find really interesting. Then if I read it a third time, I'll go through and I'll do T3. And so I can, I can not only see what was interesting me, interesting to me at different times, but also sometimes I'll get so excited reading a book. I don't know if you do this, but I'll, I'll highlight so much of like, okay, well I might as well have not highlighted anything because I highlighted everything. And uh, then the second time around, I'll be a little bit more uh, precise maybe. And uh, so then I can go back and I have my own table of contents, which it looks like is, is similar to what you do. Yeah. What I what I found out is in reading books now is when I go back on the second passage of the book, uh, reading it, I find uh, some pages that where where I didn't have anything underlined, and and so just my inquisitive self, I'll go back and and read that page, and there'll be three or four things that 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 I want to underline or I want to ponder on, and. And I can't understand. Wow, how did I miss this? So the second reading for me is is, is revealing because I always find something that I missed that that maybe my brain just was uh, was was functioning too fast or I was being distracted. And so uh, I've learned that this, a second reading is is, is vitally important. And so then the last thing I would do is I would end up transferring these to journals. And I actually have book notes back to, to 1972 is when I started to, to, to keep them in three ring binders. And what I would do is when I was done with a book, I would just give the book to my, at those days it was secretary, so I'd give it to my secretary and she would type out everything that I had underlined in the book and then she'd create a cover page for it. And so I, I have uh, uh, three ring binders. I probably have 12 or 15 from Washington State, and I, I probably have, I, I only stayed at Iowa four years, but I'd say I probably have about eight from uh, um, Iowa and and probably maybe 15 or 20 from USC. So I actually have them, uh, the, my, my, I saved my notes over the years. And one thing that, I, that they've been a great source of, of not only learning and reflection, but I, I can I find information that I can utilize in, in, in speeches. And it's, it's interesting also when you look back in the, I, I think people uh, 50 years ago placed a greater uh, importance on, on on writing skills and word usages and it was it was an art form now and 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 and, 
and how people go about explaining themselves is. Uh, but most of the books I read, I, I, I uh, there are very few of them that I don't come away and feel that I'm a better person. One of the things I like to ask myself at the close of every day is, what did I do to make myself a better person than I was yesterday? What did I learn today? And and, and so uh, from a, a talk that I do, I say that we, every day is composed of 86,400 seconds of, of opportunities. And how shameful is it for me to, at the close of my day to say that I didn't do anything today to make myself a better person than I was yesterday. And that's shame on me because I had 86,400 seconds of opportunities to do something, e- even if it's no more than, than, than a, a thank you, a random smile, a pat on the back. Think about this, Tim. There are a lot of people in in this country who go through 24 hours and never have anyone say anything to them positive. You might be the only person that day who said something to that person that was positive. Or I I know we're in a a, a different culture now, and, and I always think I'm running a little risk, but if I'm in a restaurant or somewhere and I and, and, and a person's waiting on me and he or she has a great smile, I, I invariably say, hey, you have a great smile. I, I Sometimes I feel a little uh, uneasy when I say it to a, a female because I don't want, you know, someone might think you're trying to come on to him. But at the same time, I'm willing to take that risk. So Earlier, when we were leaving breakfast, uh, as we were leaving, the two waitresses said, thanks for coming, and they had a big smile on their face. So I said to both of them, the two of you have a great smile. Well, to me, I like practicing random acts of kindness because so much today we're, we're cruel, and, and unintentionally cruel, but we, 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 we don't think... Uh, what, how valuable the little things are, the thank yous, the smiles, the taking time to listen. I had a situation, I, I still grapple with this, when people uh, ask, stop you on the street and ask for money. So we were, we were having lunch yesterday, and a, and a lady came up, and she asked for, uh, if we could spare some money. She wanted to get something to eat or drink. So I gave her $5, and I said, now, I hope you used the $5 on what you said you, you, you were going to do. So she points, and there's a little grocery store a, a few store doors down. She comes back, shows me the drink, and the $3 change. And so, wow. I, so we, we, it was a win for both of us. Yeah. But uh, I, I grapple with this thing about do I give them some money or, 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 do, I, or do I not? But... And in this case, I, I mean, I really felt good that that I was able to do, to do something for her, and she did something for me because she made me feel good that that I could trust. What she really did is is help fortify my mind that I should probably be giving more instead of less. Well, you've given a lot in a lot of ways in many years of your life, and, and certainly one capacity is that of coach uh, and we, or, or educator or teacher. And we could spend days, and hopefully we will. Hopefully we'll get to know each other even better and spend more time together. But for now, I thought we might jump forward, at least from your childhood stories, to the Olympics, 1984. And... There are many different angles we could take to to get into this, but uh, I suppose where I want to start, there's so so many different things that I want to touch on, but since we were talking about communicating and phrasing and words, could you uh, could you share the motivational quote that you came up with at that time? And I think it's each one of us has a relative who gave his life for this country. The least we can do is give 40 minutes of ourselves. Yes, that was a, that's actually a Bob Knight quote. Uh, and uh, and the, 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 it, it was a motivating force because it, when you stop and think about it, very seldom in our lifetime 
does our country ever come to us and say, we need you? It's, it's always the, the exact opposite, that, we, that uh, we're looking for something from the government. But I felt that this was a unique opportunity uh, that the country was basically saying to the, the, the team and the coaches that we need you and we need you to bring back a gold medal for us. And so this, this was a unique opportunity for us to serve our country. And I can remember vividly in the months leading up to the 84 Olympics in Los Angeles, I would envision that we were going to win the gold medal and we were going to be standing there and and uh, and to hear the national anthem play and to be at attention and and look at the American flag. I know that we're in a different era now and a different time, but the, the reality was this is how I felt. And so I I grew up in an era where where my grandma taught uh, America, right or wrong, America. Whatever the problems are, we'll work them out. But but. At the end of the day, we're an American. And so I, I envisioned what was it going to be like when we stood there and received the gold medal and, and, and um, heard the national anthem played and you, and you had the satisfaction of saying to yourself, uh, mission accomplished. And it was, it, it was one of the most unique experiences I've ever had in my life to, to, to be in a position where you could represent your country and, and you could uh, uh, feel, uh, uh, have a good feeling about it. I, I, I'm sure I'll, uh, there'll be a lot of people who will question why I felt that way, but that's the truth of the matter. And I was, I was chatting with, uh, Ryan or texting with Ryan last night after he had dinner with you and uh he was he was peppering me with suggested <laughs> topics which of course we have an overabundance of but one of one of the bullets here in the notes in front of me is that re- refers to you leading the practice team to beating the dream team can you elaborate on this please and what happened was uh for the first time in the history of the Olympics, uh, the United States decided not to use college players anymore, but to use professional players. And so uh, that year, um, the Olympics were in Barcelona, and Chuck Daly was the, the head coach of the uh, U.S. team. And, of course, you had, uh, I think, the only player on that dream team that's not in the Basketball Hall of Fame right now is Christian Leitner. Was, would, he was the only college player on the roster. And, of course, you had Magic, Bird, Barkley, uh, uh, Jordan, uh, you, you name it. Was, and, uh, so Chuck and I had been lifelong friends uh, back from when he was an assistant at Duke and I was an assistant at Villanova. And uh, he was a Pennsylvanian uh, grew up in Puxatani. So we had a long standing, uh, authentic relationship. So, uh, Chuck decided that they wanted to put together a, a group of college players that would, would, uh, scrimmage the dream team twice a day in practice. And so he suggested that I be the coach. And, and so CM Newton, who was head of USA basketball at the time, called me and asked if I would, would, would be the coach of the team. And I said, I'd love to do it. So they picked the players and Bobby Hurley and, uh, uh, Chris Weber and a bunch of guys. We only had eight players and Roy Williams and I coached the team together. And so the first night that we had the scrimmage, uh, I think the NBA guys basically looked at us. This is, this is just a, a scrimmage of college guys. And so they, they, they didn't really take it as serious as we did. The college guys, they were fi- we were all fired up. This is a great opportunity. So we scrimmaged for 37 minutes, and, and we actually beat them in the scrimmage. And so uh, the word got out, and they were livid. So one thing that happened, um, I picked one of my managers from USC to be a manager for our team. And so when the, when the uh, practice ended, Larry Bird came up to me, and he said, Coach, he said, can you do me a favor? I said, sure, what? He says, can you leave a, a van and a, and a driver here or have somebody come back and pick me up? And so I said, I'll leave one of the managers with a van. So Larry hadn't shot the ball that well in the scrimmage, so he stayed 
and, and, and shot for an hour and 15 minutes straight. And so I told him, uh, uh, Dennis Johnson, who was the manager, I said, when you get back, let me know you're back. And so when he came to my room, I said, how'd it go? He said, coach, he said, it, it, unbelievable. He said, he just continually shot. He said, he only took one water break. And he, he said, he was drenched and, and uh, head to toe. And he, he looked at me and he said, coach, if Larry Bird is doing this, what should the average guy be doing? <laughs> and and it, was, it was just a great experience. Uh, uh, I, 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 so the next not the time we scrimmaged, uh, they were they were fired up. And <laughs> so we, we, I'm embarrassed to say this, we didn't score a, a field goal for the first nine minutes. I mean, they were on us like white on rice, man. They were they said, oh, you guys think you're hot s, you know? We're going to show you. And Jordan was leading the pack. And then, so they they were determined. Okay, you guys think you're good? We're going to show you what what good is. <laughs> Uh, so, so I want to talk about coaching a team, uh, and I, I think the way I'd like to get into this I, I, is by asking if you could maybe mention just one coach that you have been impressed by, alive or dead, past, uh, present, doesn't matter, and what impressed you about them? Oh, I would say... Two coaches who, or I I'd actually have to say three, three coaches who have had an immense impact on me as a person, as a coach, my life, would be uh, Bob Knight, John Thompson, and Lefty Drizel. Lefty Drizel, I was his assistant at the University of Maryland. Uh, he was the one who taught me, uh, uh, who, who fueled my passion for reading. He was the one who, who taught taught me that uh that you don't just read the sports section he actually got me into a system that i still uh use when i go to the newspaper now the last section of the newspaper i read is sports and that's something that started back with him he also told me the importance of reading the editorial page every day and and he and then the other thing was he 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 wanted us to be the best dressed staff in the ACC so i picked up a lot of habits of, uh fr- from lefty uh that that i have to to this day john thompson and i grew up in the same neighborhood in washington dc um he had, he's had so much influence on the way I think, the the way I act, what I believe. Um, uh, w- the one thing I learned with John is when you're around John, you talk to listen ratio. The listen ratio should be 90 percent and the talk should be 10, because if it's any other way, you've 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 lost a great opportunity to, to learn and to, and to be taught because he's he's a he was John is a maverick thinker and he was a maverick thinker before the connotation even existed. And the other person, Bob Knight. Uh, it just had an absolutely amazing impact on me. I, I was at a summer league game as an assistant coach at Villanova, and at halftime I go down to look at the scoreboard, and the guy taps me on the back, and, and I turn, and he says, hi, my name's Bob Knight, assistant at West Coach, West Point. And I say, hi, George Raveling, assistant at Villanova. And from that moment on, we had a, a lifelong friendship, and that's how I ended up being the assistant coach on the 84 Olympic team. But Maybe Bob's greatest gift to me was that he saw something that in me that I never saw in myself, and he was relentless to, to, make, to make sure that I achieved it. He, he said to me, George, if we're going to survive in this profession, we have to become an expert in some phase of the game. And you need to make yourself an expert in some phase of the game. Bob's was defense. And so he said to me, he said, I know you speak a lot at clinics on rebounding. That's your niche. you got to make yourself the foremost authority on the globe on rebounding. And then he stayed after me on the phone. He called me one night. He said, hey, I, I, I looked it up in the, in the uh, Library of Congress. There's no book in the Library of Congress on rebounding. So you got a unique opportunity. And so I still didn't believe that I could actually write a, a, a book. And so he, he, Bob just stayed after me. So finally he said, 
uh, write it, write, write an outline and send it to me. And, and of course, we didn't have the technology. We did it, so I wrote an outline and sent it to him. So little did I know he was setting me up for us to walk me through this. And so the the moral of the story is, I end up writing a, a book called uh, uh, one I worked was uh, Rebounders Workshop, and and the war, and the other one's called War on the Boards. That that was the the thesis and the manuscript for uh, the art of rebounding. And I I, I I've probably sold a hundred thousand copies over the years of of the book. But without Bob staying on me and and being relentless and never accepting no, he helped me find something inside of me that I, I would have never in my life ever thought I would have written a book and or even had the talent to do. But he he saw something in me that other people didn't see in me, and and that's been a, a lot of of. of of, of the relevance for this magical carpet ride I've had in life, people seeing something in me that I didn't see in myself. My grandma seeing something in me, my sister Dolores seeing something in me, uh, my high school coach seeing something in me, my co- my uh, my college coach Al Severance. He said something, Tim, that I'll never ever forget. One time he was talking to us and he said, "The first sign of intelligence is to admit that you don't know something." And and uh, here I am, 80 years old, and and I I, I still re- remember him telling me this that, and and so I've I've learned so much. Everyone that, including yourself, have have touched my life in a in a in a productive way. If I don't re- read Tools to the Titan, I don't learn about Mastermind. If I don't learn about Mastermind, I kill myself in 20 different relationships. I. Uh, uh, I I learned things about people that I didn't know. So uh, it's it's just been a blessed journey uh, that you meet people who are willing to help you continue to grow, especially at 80 years. Oh, when I, you you think, Tim, from at 60 years old, the, the thought process in America was you retire, you get a gold watch, and you, you, you live happily ever after. But between 60 and 80, it's, it might be the most productive years of my life. I've grown so much. I've, I was 63 years old, and I get appointed global uh, director of sports marketing at Nike at 63 years old. So how does you defy the odds? Ex-basketball coach, black. No business background, and you're running. You're running uh, a Fortune 500 category, and uh, and I can remember many times thinking that uh, all of the four years I spent at Villanova, uh, I was an econ major, an economics major, and at that time they didn't call it this uh, business school; they called it School of, of Commerce and Finance. So I graduated with a degree in economics, and I used to think. God, I, this is a waste of time. I learned all this. I'm never going to use it. And little did I be, know that at 63 years old, all this was going to come back to fruition and, and it was going to be necessary. Uh, and uh, so it, it, it did pay off. And uh, as, as I understand it, the, um, the job offer, uh, or at least your beginning with Nike, came through what seemed like a prank call. From uh, Phil Knight, at least that's what I have read. So yeah, you well, got the- actually, <laughs> it started long before that. When I went went to work uh, full time for them, I get this call, and then we'll go back to the to the origin. Uh, I get a call one night, and I answer the phone, and and the voice says, "This is Philip Knight," and that's basically how Phil always addresses it to this day. If he calls, he's going to say, "This is Philip Knight," and so I. For a momentarily, I thought oh, somebody put me on. So then I said, uh, uh, "Is it really?" He said, "Yeah, it's full night." And I said, uh, "What's going on?" And he said, uh, "I just called to see if you'd be interested in coming to work for Nike full time." And so we talked it through. And I said, "Well, what do you want me to do?" And he said, "I want you to come." And at that time, Nike had this this camp called the All American Camp, and he said, "I want you to upgrade it, but I want I want to figure out how we can reach uh, younger kids." And so, 
I still have somewhere in storage the original presentation that I made to him to start a grassroots program. At that time, there was no such thing as a grassroots program. And and so that was the start of me working full time. But I actually started at Nike in, in, in 1978. The Nike decides they're going to get college coaches to endorse their product, and they fly 11 of us to Las Vegas, and uh, uh, Jerry Tarkini was one, Jimmy Valvano, and so forth. And so John Slusher Sr. and Phil came and made the presentation to us, and essentially they would give you a, a compensation and all the product for you and your, your team. And this is in 78. And so... Uh, I was sitting beside Bill Foster, who was coaching at Clemson at the time. And so the, the, the second day, we had to make a decision. And so part of it was they give you the compensation. The compensation was 5000 in cash or 5000 in stock. The, the, the impediment, it really wasn't, as it turned out, was if you took the stock, you couldn't catch the stock for five years. And at that time, the stock was about six bucks. And so Bill Foster leans over to me and he says, George, take the stock, take the stock. I'll, I'll explain to you later. He said, all these other idiots are going to take the cash. <laughs> and so the, the, the five year thing ended up being a disciplinary uh, factor, because even if you wanted to, you couldn't cash it. So so then when the the, the five years passed. Bill called me about six months before the due date, and he said, you, you listen to me again. Don't cash the stock. Don't cash the stock. Just let it roll over. You got this far without it. You can get the rest of the way. So anyway, uh, by the time I finally sold the stock, it, w- it was up to 46 bucks. So I went, <laughs> and, and, and it was split. And so. But to go back, I, so that year in 78, Nike sends Bill Foster, myself, and Eddie Sutton to, uh, to China for a month to do clinics. And so we went to, uh, to Peking, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. So at that time, Beijing did not exist. Subsequently, Beijing uh, was uh, Peking was replaced with Beijing, but at that time, uh, it was called Peking. And so we we went uh, and and did these clinics in China. And at that time, it was highly communistic. Everybody dressed the same. The, w- the women dressed with white blouse and, and olive green slacks, and and the men had these little uh, Nehru jackets of olive green. And they had a, a cap with the red star on it. They could speak no English. And so one day we're in Tenement Square, and Bill Foster's wife had a, a, a Polaroid camera, and she was taking pictures. And so she took a, a picture of a, a group of Chinese people standing together conversating. And so when and then when it developed, she showed it to them, and they were they, it was like um, we might as well have been for the moon. They were so we couldn't tell what they were saying, but they were they were so excited, pointing, and then more people came, and they they had no idea of uh, 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 how this was transpiring. So here's here's a, 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 an interesting story, Tim. So a Chinese gentleman steps out of the crowd and he comes up to me and he and he and he, and he picks my hand up and he rubs my hand, and looks at his fingers, and so it was apparent he had never seen a black person before <laughs> in his life, and he thought it was paint. Wow! And so he was rubbing to see if the paint because he couldn't figure out he'd never seen a black person before, and it's this it's, it's a story that's left an indelible mark on my my uh, stay. But it, it, that was maybe the, one of the great trips of of all time. I tell you one other quick story. We're doing a clinic in in Shanghai, and the, and the uh, interpreter comes up to me at the end of my lecture, and he says, "Coach," he says. Uh, this coach would like to borrow your rebounding book and he'll bring it back in the morning. So I thought he just wanted to take it home and read it. So the next morning he comes back, sure enough, he gives me the book and he's got 25 copies of it. <laughs> he's overnight, he printed 25 <laughs> copies of the book and gave me mine back. Welcome to China. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you started working full time at Nike at, at age 63. Is yeah. that right? Well, no. I I'd actually uh, I took the global uh, uh, sports marketing job at sixty three. I actually uh, had put in about eight years in, in, in developing this grassroots uh, uh, program right. at, at Nike, and then subsequently I got this opportunity to to, to be the the global director. And you mentioned uh, 
a familiar name to a lot of people, Michael Jordan earlier from the Dream Team. And I've seen a photograph of you with a very young Michael Jordan. Uh, so I've read that you were the one who actually convinced Michael Jordan to sign with Nike, uh, or certainly were one of the driving factors there. Could you, could you share that story? Yeah, I don't know if I would go that far, but I was a conduit. Uh, so early uh, when we, at the Olympic trials, uh, Sonny Vaccaro, who was then uh, heading up Nike basketball, and Phil had came to me and they said, hey, can you see if you can get Michael to visit with us? And so uh, we were still training in Bloomington. So I, I brought the subject up with Michael. What happened was, uh, I don't know exactly how this happened, but Vern Fleming, who was on a team from Georgia, Patrick Ewan, myself and Michael, we were inseparable the whole Olympic experience. We went everywhere together, we, and we were like the four amigos. We'd go to McDonald's, we'd go to the movies, the shopping mall. Wherever we did, it was always the four of us. And, and so I uh, developed a really uh, unique relationship with Michael. So from time to time, I would bring it up to him about the Nike thing without being overbearing. And in the very beginning, he said, Coach, he says, yeah, I have no interest in Nike. I'm an Adidas guy. I'm going to go to Adidas. Uh, I, I don't even like their product. And so every now and then I would bring it up, and he, he would say, Coach, I'm telling you, man, it's, it's a waste of time. I'm going to be an Adidas guy. So now we get through the uh, – uh, we're at the Olympics, and we get through pool play, and we have a day off. And so – Sonny Vaccaro calls and he says, hey, can you bring Michael, get him to come over and meet, meet me at Tony Romer's in Santa Monica? So I bring it up to Michael, and I think just out of frustration to get rid of me, he just said, okay, I'll go. So we're going over in the car, and then he said, coach, this is, I'm only doing this for you. He said that uh, it's a waste of time. Whatever a, a Nike offers me, I'm going to take it to Adidas, and if Adidas matches it, that's it. That's who I want to be. So to, to fast forward, he ends up, him and his mom and dad and David Falk come up to Nike for a visit, and the meeting is, is successful, but it didn't move the needle because Michael was still uh, convinced that he should go with uh, Under Armour. But part of the Nike or deal— Adidas. I mean, I'm sorry, with, yeah. with, with, with Adidas. And so part of the deal was, at that time, there was no such thing as a signature shoe. And so David Falk came up with this idea of Air Jordan. Jordan. And so, uh, and Nike would make a, a signature shoe that would be marketed under this, this logo of Air Jordan. And so when the meeting goes well, we think we got a shot. And so true to his word, Michael took the deal back or David took the deal back to Adidas and Adidas passed on it because of the signature shoe thing, because they didn't feel there was any market for it. And and uh, and they they still made him an offer, but but they they wouldn't go on the signature shoe thing. And and I, if I remember correctly, Michael was getting five cents a, a royalty on the shoe. So at any rate, uh, Michael ended up accepting the. Uh, the offer from Nike, and as they say on television, the, the rest was history. But here we are today, and and Jordan brand is is a business of it of its own. So so like there's Nike Inc., and then you have these subsets: Hurley, Converse, Jordan brand. So Jordan brand is the second biggest seller of basketball shoes in the world. Basketball shoes, other than Nike Inc. And uh, they sell more basketball shoes than Under Armour or or Adidas. And so here you, you go back to 84, and here today uh, he sits at the head of, a, of a, one of the most profitable sport, sport uh, footwear companies in, in the world. And what's interesting, which historians will put in their rightful place one day, is Nike was the first Fortune 500 company to take a black male and make them the face of their company. And then you, I'm sure you're familiar with the Spike Lee ads and all those things like that. And so there was a huge uh, a risk in some ways. But one time I mentioned to Michael about Nike taking a risk. And so he quickly came back to me. He says, Nike took a risk. Hey, I took a risk too. <laughs> So you've, you've spent so much time 
teaching and guiding and cultivating players and uh, people who work for you and the people around you. Uh, I had read, and please feel free to, to correct this, but that um, you've said the most important conversation is the one you have with yourself. Right. Yeah. So could you, could you elaborate on that, please? Because I, 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 I think that self-talk is, and I'm not sure that's what you're referring to, but so, so terribly important. Uh, so I'd love, love to hear you just elaborate on that. The older I've uh, gotten, the more I've come to, 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 to f- the conclusion that the, the, that the conversation that you have every day with yourself as you characterize it, self-talk is so vital. It's far more important than the conversations you have with those around you. And the best part about the conversation with yourself is you're in total control of that conversation. You can craft the conversation any way you want to. And so I try to to have at least 90% of the conversations that I have with myself, which I have two or three times a day, uh, that that it's positive self-talk. If I start to linger on to something uh, negative, then what I'll do is I'll immediately deal with it and discount it. Uh, For example, uh, 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 since I'm Catholic, I'll make this confession. So this morning when I got up, (laughs) Your reputation is so impeccable that I was, I was, uh, you know, I got up at five. I'm really nervous. I'm thinking to myself, God, what if I, if I do a bad job, I'll be so embarrassed. And so the minute I started thinking that, I said, nope, that's not it. Get fired up, man. You're going to do it. And I'm so, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in the bathroom and I'm, 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 I'm doing this motivational talk for myself to eradicate any doubt that I have. And, 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 and I keep saying to myself, you got to go in there. You got to give me the best shot. Don't, you can do it. I'm, so I'm, I'm getting myself fired up for it. And this but, is out loud. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because uh, uh, I really spend uh, as much time as uh, probably at least, well, I wouldn't say probably once a day, I'll find an hour to just go someplace and sit by myself. And all I do is take a, a, a notebook and, and just put it in a pen in front of me, and I'll just sit there and think. Whatever comes into my mind, and then, then I start to fixate on those things, and, or I'll write down notes as a result of something that I think, or I'll write out a strategy. For example, the way I govern my day, Tim, is, is uh, I get up in the morning and I put my two feet beside the bed and I say to myself, okay, George, you only have two choices today. These are the only two choices that you have and you got to make one. And the two choices are to be happy or to be very happy. And, and there's no other choice. And so then I start to plan, uh, plan out my day. And I'm all, and so I, I have these, these points of focus, energy, uh, a time man, energy management, time management, environmental management, productivity. And to me, productivity is a byproduct of the other three. So how do I manage my, my energy every day so that I can, I can be at maximum efficiency? So one of the things I try to do is declutter my mind. I won't do any more than four things a day. And it, 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 it reverts back to something one of the presidents at Nike, Charlie Denson, said one time in a leadership meeting. He said, let me ask you guys this. Would we be better off doing 25 things good or would we be better off doing six things great? And so to me, to make simplify my day, I, I will not do more than four things. I, 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 I try to limit the meetings to two, and, and if it's two, one of them is usually a breakfast meeting. I, when I go into the office, I have, I, 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 I have a total commitment once I get into the office to be totally f- focused on, on on business matters, try to d- be as disciplined as I can not to get on the telephone, and and also to meet with 
with the two people that work with me, we meet every single day and we talk as a team because I, I want us to function as a team. I want each person's opinion to be valued. If one person happens to be 50 years younger than me, so what? Their, 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 their opinion is valuable to me. I respect everyone's knowledge and I think to myself, they know something that I don't know. And so I, I want to value their opinion. So uh, we meet every day as a staff. We talk about things, and and uh, it helps me grow, and, and it keeps my day simplified. I try to clean – I try to – once a week, have a a, 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 a personal audit. I, I I go back through the week and I audit my week and 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 make course corrections along the way. So that's when I really get into the self talk part is having these little mental audits that my life's just not going on and on and on. I I, I try to evaluate: Am I making progress? What am I doing that's good? What am I doing that's that's not working? And then make those course corrections and. At 80 years old, I try to hold myself to the most severe standards, uh, and and I, I I just despise the idea of retirement. I think that it's the it's the biggest force that's ever been predicated on us is this idea of retirement. Because the first thing that happens, you you, you retire your physically, and then you retire mentally, and then you 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 just taking up residence in 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 society. And I don't ever want to be a, a, a resident of society. I want to be a contributor to society. Well, you. You seem like you're just getting warmed up. Uh, you certainly have lots of energy. Uh, what are you most excited about uh, these days and working on? Well, what I get most excited about is just wait. When you're 80 years old, you, you, you damn sure better be excited that you wake up the next morning <laughs> and, you have, and you have a growth opp- opportunity. I'm still trying to understand, like most of us, what the what the future is going to be like and how can I get to the future first and what's the future going to be like but I read a lot of books and talk to a lot of people but uh, I don't know if anybody can really tell you what the world's going to be like five years from now not not ten years from now but five years from now um, we're 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 in a, a society where it behooves all of us to be comfortable with with change and to be comfortable with being uncomfortable if you could metaphorically speaking put uh anything on a billboard not not commercial but a a message a quote a word a question somebody else's quote could be anything to get out to millions or billions of people what what type of message or word or quote or anything might might you put on that billboard I would say if I could put up a billboard and and a message to people, the quote would be, if it is to be, it's up to me. Because at the end of the day, uh, each of us have an individual responsibility to ourselves and to to our society to to figure out ways to be positive difference makers. And and it all starts in life. Uh, I'm fond of reminding myself that nobody's going to row your boat for you, but you. You've got to get in and you've got to row your boat to the other side of the, the lake. And so I would remind people, as I said, if it is to be, it's up to me. And that's something that uh, I had on my office door. I had a big sign at Washington State. I had it on my office door. It's something that I've tried to, to make an indelible mark on my brain that it's up to me. If change is about the, the best, the most authentic change takes place in uh, within yourself. And so uh, before And oftentimes in life, Tim, as you know, the most important person you ever get to lead is yourself. And if you can't lead yourself, how are you going to lead other people? And so I I, I would like to to challenge people to, 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 to start to look within before they look out. Is to look within, and and wh- and what are the what are the things that I can do to 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 uh, to be a positive change make- maker in my life 
and in the life of others. And when we talk about being a positive change maker, the thought process is this is about trying to change society. But when I hear people always say, do something that will change the world. Well, if you want to do something that's going to change the world, you change first. And that's going to, that's, And if everybody started to feel that way, we'd have this huge movement of change that would be authentic. Here, here. I'm getting all fired up. You're good at that, Coach. Uh, I want to be respectful of your time. So I think we're going to wrap up shortly here, but is there anything else you'd like to share? Any other parting words? Certainly people can find you at George Raveling on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, website, coachgeorgeraveling.com. I encourage everybody to check it out. But is there is there anything else that you'd like to recommend you to people? You just got me off the hook because all, all, oh, yeah. all my youthful advisors said, said, Coach, make sure you tell people how to how to stay in touch with you. <laughs> but um, it, it, it's, it's it, all... Technology has helped me be, uh, create a platform of sharing to try to share. One thing my grandma said to me one time, she was correcting me, and, and I was a little smart alecky. And so she looked at me in a stern way, and she said, she said, boy, let me tell you something. I know where the potholes are in life, and maybe if you listen to me, I can help you avoid stepping into them. So at 80 years old, I, th- I think of my grandma and I say, hey, I, I know where a lot of the potholes are in life, and maybe I can tell you where they are and share my life experiences with you so that you don't have to step into those potholes. And so that's what I try to do is, is to, to share. An old guy told me one time, nothing in life is of any value unless you can share it with other people. And so that is the essence of me at 80 years old. What is it that I have that I can share with others, and what can I give away? I I don't even know if I said this to my wife yet, so you, you're going to be the beneficiary of a, of, a, of a movement. I now have committed that I'm going to try to give away most of my personal belongings. I'm going to give away all my clothes and all my books. I won't. I'm trying to give away as much stuff as I can to simplify my life. I can only wear one pair of shoes. I can only wear one pair of underwear. I don't need all these things. And so I'm going to uh, rid myself of all these these material things that I thought were important at at 80 years old. The money's not that, I learned money's not that important. Uh, collecting things are not that important. Uh, how you dress, we, all those things become uh, uh, a, what I call surrender. Someone tells you what time to get up in the morning, what time to go to bed, what to eat, what to dress, or how to act. And so we end up being prisoners of someone else's expectations. So I want to live the whatever time I have left and I want to, as Martin Luther King said, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty we're free at last. I, I just want to be free of, of all these, these, these fences that society has put up around me. And, and I want to try to find out where are my outer limits. And, and once you take down the fences, you allow a person to seek their outer limits. And that's what I'm trying to do at 80 years old is to figure out where my outer limits are and to keep reaching for them. Well, Coach, I hope to have many more conversations with you. So uh, thank, thank you, you so much, sir. Thank you. And uh, may, you, may you be around for at least another 80. And what a gift of a conversation. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you giving me the time. And uh, for everybody listening, for links to everything we talked about, certainly where you can find Coach Raveling online and learn what he's up to. In addition to the books that we discussed and everything else, you can find all of that linked in the show notes at tim.blog forward slash podcast. What a ride. And uh, to everybody out there, until next time, thank you for listening. Hey guys, this is Tim again. Just a few more things before you take off. Number one, this is Five Bullet Friday. Do you want to get 
a short email from me? And would you enjoy getting a short email from me every Friday that provides a little morsel of fun before the weekend? And Five Bullet Friday is a very short email where I share the coolest things I've found or that I've been pondering over the week. That could include favorite new albums that I've discovered. It could include gizmos and gadgets and all sorts of weird shit that I've somehow dug up in the uh, the world of the esoteric as I do. It could include favorite articles that I've read and that I've shared with my close friends, for instance. And it's very short. It's just a little tiny bite of goodness before you head off for the weekend. So if you want to receive that, check it out. Just go to fourhourworkweek.com. That's fourhourworkweek.com, all spelled out, and just drop in your email, and you will get the very next one. And if you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by FreshBooks. FreshBooks has become the go-to cloud accounting software for literally millions of small business owners who found a faster, more efficient, and much less stressful way to deal with their numbers. And ultimately, this helps you to focus on what you are best at. It is used by many of the fastest growing startups I've invested in or advise, and it's equally used by many of the best freelancers I work with on a daily or weekly basis. It is one of the easiest ways to send invoices, get paid, track your time, and track your clients. If you're self-employed and managing business sometimes means wrestling with spreadsheets, crumpled receipts, and other scattered pieces, FreshBooks can really help. FreshBooks allows you to do many, many different things very easily. Preparing and sending a polished branded invoice takes about 30 seconds. You can set yourself up to receive online payments from your clients in about two clicks, which on average will get you paid twice as fast. Their new proposals feature means you can include a project summary and timeline as part of your estimate. There are many, many other things. Tracking your time. The quick proposals that I mentioned, formatting free, super easy, late payment reminders so you don't have to chase people, automated expenses, sharing files and messages with your clients, award-winning customer service. They are extremely responsive, the interface is super intuitive, and there's almost no learning curve. So, in short, it's easy, it saves you time. And right now, FreshBooks is offering an unrestricted 30-day free trial for all of my listeners. To claim yours, check it out. Go to freshbooks.com forward slash Tim and enter Tim Ferris in the how did you hear about us section. And that is funky spell T-I-M-F-E-R-R-I-S-S. So again, go to freshbooks.com forward slash Tim and enter Tim Ferris in the how did you hear about us section. Check it out. This episode is brought to you by Audible, which has the largest selection of audiobooks on the planet. I've used Audible for many years, and I have several audiobooks to recommend right off the bat if you're looking for a new one. Ready Player One by Ernest Klein. You may have heard of it. The Tao of Seneca by Seneca, if you want to hear my favorite collection of letters of all time, as well as The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman, which is a fiction book I use to reintroduce nonfiction purists to the beauty and truth and enjoyment of fiction. Graveyard book. It is incredible. And I like the version that Neil reads himself, but the entire ensemble cast is also fun. Audible members get a credit every month good for any audiobook in the store, regardless of price, and unused credits roll over to the next month. So if you didn't like your audiobook, no problem. You can exchange it, no questions asked. Plus, your books are yours to keep. With Audible, you can go back and re-listen anytime, even if you cancel your membership. And for some books, again, Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman, I've listened many, many times. You may even just start over as soon as you finish it the first time. Audible also helps you to listen to more books by letting you switch seamlessly between devices, picking up exactly where you left off, whether it's on your phone, through your car, from a tablet, or at home, on an Amazon Echo, whatever. You can get through tons of books, hands and eyes free, while doing almost anything. So that is part of the beauty of audio. It is a secondary activity when you're walking the dog, cooking, whatever it might be. Audible content includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and much more from leading audiobook publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, magazine and newspaper publishers, and business information providers. Maybe that's what I am, a business information provider. And right now, Audible is offering listeners of this podcast a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Check it out. Go to audible.com forward slash Tim and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It is super simple. Go to audible.com forward slash Tim or text Tim to 500 500 on your telephone to get started today. Check it out.